Okay, we're going to be looking specifically at neurotransmitters and synapses, talking about how neurons actually fire, and then we're going to talk about some drug-related things. There's going to be a lot of good projects that you could try on this, not by trying these drugs, but researching online and learning how these drugs work, but I'm going to give you an overview of how everything works. So your body system is telling you all kinds of things. It's like people telling you, I mean, this is like teenage angst. Do it, don't do it, do it, don't do it. So all these different messages that you're receiving externally, your body and your brain are actually doing this as well too. So you have neurons that are telling you to fire particular action potentials and then there are particular neurons that are telling you to not fire. They're called excitatory and inhibitory synapses basically. So some of these presynaptic neurons will excite postsynaptic transmission. You have to make sure you understand a bit about um, neuron firing and what happens at the synapse between neurons before you fully understand this. I'm not going to explain all of it right now. But in general, across a synapse, so synapse is a gap between the axon terminal and the dendrite of another neuron. Some of those neurons can cause excitation, which basically says fire, and then some of those neurons will say don't fire. And so whether or not this, this neuron actually fires will depend on the total amount of messages that it receives. If it receives more, let's just use positive or negative, for example. If it receives more positive messages than negative messages, then that will override the negative messages and then it will actually fire. If it receives more negative messages or inhibitory messages versus excitatory messages, then it will prevent itself from firing. So whether an action potential actually fires or not depends on the summation of the effects of these two types of presynaptic neurons, the excitatory and the inhibitory. I guess logically then, if you have the exact same number of excitatory neurons um, against the exact same number of inhibitory neurons, then overall, I guess you wouldn't have any kind of firing happening. Psychoactive drugs. We're going to learn about two specific things, uh, cocaine and THC. There's other types of drugs that you can learn about, so uh, please check those out. The thing about getting high, so when people talk about the attraction of doing these drugs, there's many different reasons. We're going to focus on the physiological ones. So when you take these drugs, and you shouldn't try this, by the way, but when people take these drugs, what they're doing is they're affecting the synapse. They're affecting the interactions between the neurons. And so these drugs can get classified into different categories based on their effects on the neurons. So if something increases postsynaptic transmission, then this is probably going to be some kind of excitatory drug. And cocaine is going to do that. And we're going to look at exactly what it does in the synapse. THC, on the other hand, which is the active ingredient in cannabis or marijuana, is inhibitory because it actually is going to do something to... Uh, delay neurotransmitters from moving across. In order for a message to be transmitted from one neuron to another, neurotransmitters have to diffuse across that gap. So if you do something to mess with that, then you're probably going to be decreasing the excitation of the actual nervous system. So let's look at cocaine and THC in detail. But first, uh, just a, a quick list. Excitatory drugs versus inhibitory drugs. You've already guessed. I've already told you that cocaine is excitatory and marijuana is inhibitory. Other things, nicotine falls into that category with cocaine and amphetamines as well. Inhor inhibitory drugs include benzodiazepines, which are loosely classified as sleeping pills, alcohol as an example, and then THC, the active ingredient in marijuana as well too. Crystal meth fits into this category if you've been watching Breaking Bad, and uh, I wouldn't consider doing what Walter White does. So what exactly does cocaine do? So if you look at a diagram like this, you can see that here is the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. Here's the gap called the synapse or the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft, all kinds of names. And here's the beginning of the next neuron or at least one of the dendrites, the next neuron. The message that gets transmitted down here is all like sodium and potassium, blah, blah, blah. But in order to cross this gap, sodium and potassium don't cross this gap. So these neurotransmitters have to actually go across. And there's different types. And in this case, it's called dopamine. 
Now, when cocaine is present, well, normally what's supposed to happen is these neurotransmitters are meant to diffuse across, they bind to some receptors, and then the action potential can increase with sodium and potassium uh, diffusing in and then out down this direction. So this has to happen normally. Now, when cocaine is there, this is pretty, this is pretty easy to understand. So just think about this diagram. Normally what happens is these neurotransmitters, they go across and they bind, and after they're done binding, if we don't need to send a message anymore, these neurotransmitters will get either broken down or taken back up and repackaged into vesicles awaiting the next message to be fired. But cocaine comes and it acts as a blocker. It blocks these reuptake channels. So what happens then? The neurotransmitter when it tries to go back to get repackaged into vesicles cannot because these reuptake channels are being blocked. So as a result, there's more dopamine hanging out here and it just and it binds to this even when it's not supposed to and it ends up causing more firing of this. And then what you perceive is a more stimulated nervous system. So more action potentials are fired as a result. Let's look at THC. THC does something different. THC, so you understand how this works. What THC does is it binds to some kind of receptors on the presynaptic neuron and just simply prevents these vesicles from reaching this membrane. And as a result, if something blocks the actual release of these neurotransmitters, then there will be no, trans no neurotransmitters actually going across, or it will be, it'll be greatly reduced. And so you end up with less firing overall. So THC binds the receptors in the presynaptic membrane. It binds the receptors here. This prevents neurotransmitters from being released. So less action potentials are fired as a result. And that's perceived as a kind of slower response. It's well documented that people who are smoking marijuana have lower uh, reaction time. So you shouldn't be driving or doing anything that requires you to be very alert. So last thing, this is something you can kind of think about a little bit. There's a lot of things that go into addiction. So genetic predisposition, there's conflicting research about that. Um, dopamine secretion, is a, it's a feel-good feel neurotransmitter. It's a feel-good chemical. And so changing that, messing with those amounts, uh, can also become attractive for some people. And then addiction, there's various kinds of physiological things where if, you're, if your body's used to having cocaine present, then what it'll do is it'll try to compensate by reducing the amount of neurotransmitters that are actually secreted. And so if you come off of that, then you, have, you end up with withdraw withdrawal symptoms. And in order to feel normal, you have to take these drugs. Again, that's what addiction is. And that's the complications. Uh, so those are some of the complications that come about from withdrawal. And then there's also social factors as well, peer pressure, various other reasons as well too. So have a good think about that and uh, don't do drugs, kids.